documentary, Waiting for Superman, can help to focus our attention on public schools. Well, first I want to thank you all for agreeing to be part of this dialogue. Um, this is the first in a series of dialogues about critical community issues. Um, we're going to be speaking tonight about education, and uh, the idea is to take this from multiple angles. And we want to start by talking a bit about the infrastructure of our educational system. And Paul, we want to begin with you. If you could comment a bit on sort of what is it from a district level um, that we should be looking at uh, to make for a successful classroom experience? I think the key word you used was system. If we're an educational system, it means we do things in a systematic way. I like to use the word coherence in our system. And what that means fundamentally is that we have a set of operating principles that we use system-wide, and those really get to a belief that our results drive our decision-making about kids, it drives our professional development. It, it really sits at the top of the system that says, first of all, we understand the targets. Everybody understands the targets we want the kids to hit in all our different subject areas. And, and after we understand the targets, we're talking about how we're going to how we're going to measure uh, progress toward those targets. Uh, measurement, if you want to call it assessment, primarily serves uh, instruction. It's, 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 assessment is the primary role there. And that's kind of the seminal change here in what we're seeing in education reform, is a focus on results, which drive our practice and our professional development. And that's from a superintendent's perspective. And I was going to ask Sally, from a principal's perspective, what, what makes a successful and functioning district? So this is a very interesting topic for me because this was my dissertation study and um, I completed that in 2002 through 2004 and at that time there was some uh, studies, bigger studies in the literature about conditions for districts and how they promoted student achievement and now we actually have factors or um, practices at the district level that can be correlated to student achievement. But as a school principal, I think that in the same way I buffer teachers from a lot of the kinds of things Paul's discussing, districts serve to buffer schools um, from a lot of the mandates and works that they need to do, but also can really promote student achievement through coherence, alignment, um, providing the right assessments, making sure that teachers have professional time, making sure that the principals um, who are effective are in place, et cetera. So districts matter. We know that. Okay. John, as, a, as someone outside the formal structure, but someone working with a large piece of these various educational structures, do you have any observations about, about what you see working and not working? Well, I, I certainly have some questions, um, and we're talking about systems and coherence, and Paul talked about kids before they get to kindergarten. I mean, if we define this problem as what happens within a school district between K through 12, is, are there enough answers on the table to get it done? And I'm not an expert, but I think some of the evidence is no. I mean, what do you do when you know a lot of your kids aren't entering kindergarten anywhere close to ready? And how does that become part of the system? When we know that preschools are really disconnected from kindergartners, what do you do when you know that a lot of the kids uh, in your school have social, emotional, or family issues that really keep them from learning? And there's a dramatic disconnect between the schools and social service agencies. So how do you build sort of a broader coherent system that integrates and works together seems to be something that hasn't been on the table, something we don't have a lot of examples of. Um, and I, you know, I, I asked the, the experts, like, can we get from where we are to where we need to be if we're not willing to think earlier and more broadly around the core educational system in the schools? And certainly as our foundation, our, our draft answer is no. You know, we do need to draw answers and systems together that have not been part of that discussion. Do you have any examples of, of things that have worked well, especially with the recent push for this sort of performance monitoring and assessment? Uh, are the things we've seen that have worked at a systems level, uh, to, to go back to, to Paul's initial point, that, that we could offer up here as, as things that you're looking at to potentially either something you've implemented here at home or that you have seen elsewhere? Well, I will go in. Um, Certainly. California Teachers Association, uh, about five years ago was part of a lawsuit when Governor Schwarzenegger uh, was going to not properly fund Prop 98, which is a voter approved minimum funding level uh, proposition for the state of California for education. Uh, the result of that suit was a program called Quality Education Investment Act, QEIA. Uh, we have one QEIA school here locally, McKinley. McKinley just experienced a 49 point jump on their API. Uh, the teachers, I think, are very dialed into what's going on, the delivery of services that Paul suggested, that it's a system working there. Um, I had a chance to visit the school with the county when they first entered into this, and they had five different language arts programs being used simultaneously. And uh, as you said, 
the difference between a kid six, three months apart is, is monumental. Well, when you have five different language arts programs being used, it's very hard to get kids to go in the right direction and really have any concrete learning. So uh, I believe that the, you know, the, the instrument that the California Teacher Association really brought forth on that was one that's really shown some very dramatic uh, uh, successes in our state. Are there other examples that folks would like to put on the table as successful system-wide approaches to, to addressing this question of, of performance at the classroom level? I think that um, we're recently a partnership school with UCSB, so it's really uh, was just board approved last year, and we're at the inception, so Tina can share mm-hmm. too. Some of the things I think we're doing that whole promise is really how do you t- help develop teachers who are veteran teachers, aspiring teachers together, and um, in what ways can you create a school where everyone is learning, which is really part of our school vision. And um, one of the best examples of where we've seen that work is in our third grade math scores. We had 88% of the kids proficient or advanced, which for our school is outperformed some of the highest performing schools in our district. Mm -hmm. And I really attribute that to a math program with Dr. Bill Jacobs from the math department, um, a summer school lab school where teachers come in and teach and other teachers from aspiring teachers and veteran teachers come and see what that looks like and they debrief together. And... um, coupled with a problem-solving study where we have small group graduate students coming in and collecting data, but also providing interventions for kids. And so I think that that holds a lot of promise, and we're very excited about it. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you for bringing that up. Can, actually, Tina, can you speak to that? Can, can we actually deal with this from a teacher training perspective in a way that you actually train enough teachers in a particular skill set, particular set of models, that it, it results effectively in a systems-wide change? Well, I think that's a really important part of this whole system is it's, it's also what happens, uh, we're talking about what happens to children before they come into the K-12 schools, and we're also talking about what happens to teachers before they come into their service their, of their profession. And um, more than ever, and now we need to have um, collaborations between districts and schools and universities in the preparation of teachers. Teacher preparation needs a, a major reform. Um, I think we're all pretty clear on that. Okay. We're actually going to transition to teacher preparedness and administrative preparedness, too, in a moment. One more issue I want to just toss out before mm-hmm. we leave uh, the systems approach is the money question and how that actually affects the, the systems. We, we may have some wonderful ideas out there. I know the role that philanthropy has tried to play uh, in many cases to step in and, and augment those public funding streams which are either not there or being cut back. Um, but what are, are your experiences with the money challenges? And I want to go back to you, Paul, to talk from a, a superintendent's perspective to start with. But what are you seeing and, and sort of how dire is it at this point? Well, uh, a week ago, Monday, we did our annual community meeting. It's like a uh, state of the district meeting. And we reported that uh, we have cut our district ten, cut our district budget 10 straight years. And, and, and in, the, in the same time span, our uh, population has become uh, more economically disadvantaged, more English learner, more Latino. So the money's going in one direction, and the level of need in terms, the historic level of need in terms of the students is going mm-hmm. in the other. And yet we reported that our achievement has gone up every single year. Remarkably so. Someone might say, well, that's great. I I see there is this inverse relationship between money and achievement, and we should give you less money to get more achievement. (laughs) No. Less is not more. I'll tell you, though, uh, what's happened is that we know more about what we can do to to advance kids than we've ever known. There's nothing arcane about it. You, You do certain things in concert in a system, and it works. And why it's been an epiphany or an all of a sudden change is something maybe Dr. Kingston here can, can answer. But there is only so much I can do with the funds that I have to provide targeted professional development, to, to do the things I need to do to help people grow professionally. And, and, and I'm here to say, and as much as we've shown great strides in our system achievement-wise, we are at the point of saying, help, you know, this, this can't go on. There, there can't be this hue and cry for better public schools when, uh, at least in our own state right now, you know, we're going to see, and Lane, I'm looking at you because I'm sure you're following this. Right. I'm pretty sure we're going to see mid-year cuts. I don't I think agree. it's an if, I think it's a when. So we have, uh, we do have a crisis. We do have a crisis when we have this growing population of needy kids. I really believe personally that California's economic woes are in large part rooted in the skewed economy that it's, that it's had that depends on a large pool of unskilled and poorly educated people. And Jeff, if I can, I mean, Please. Just, it's... 
<coughs> certainly private dollars are very small compared to the public money that goes in the school system, but I think one of the things we're learning in collaboration with a bunch of people at this table is we as private philanthropists can spend our money in a lot more intelligent way and need to ask different questions, um, whereas the old model before was give a nonprofit a grant, have them go to a group and say, you know, we've got this great thing we think you should do in your school and we really need to flip that conversation around and be in a different conversation with the folks that are responsible and accountable for results and with kids and say, so what do you think you need and how can we help? And it's it's it really is turning the table. And I, I know um, both with Sally and with Paul, we've had um, with some other funders, you know, I think real progress, not only in the programs we put together, but just asking different questions. And again, not coming with our answers, but coming with a, we have to partner, we have to work together in a different way. So leveraging our funds better, because I would think, I think private philanthropy hasn't fully wasted a lot of money, but I think we spend it a lot less effectively than we could have. But I'm going to go back to actually a point that you made, Paul, which is that in this time of cutbacks, you said 10 consecutive years, in some ways it's forced you to look at things in a different way. And in fact, you, there may be a, a positive side effect to, to being forced to look at certain things. Um, I, I wouldn't go far so far as to suggest that, that more cuts is a good thing. But can we talk about some of those things that in the absence of the resources that you might have hoped for or expected that you've, you've discovered about your own systems? And actually, I want to look at you, Sally, and talk maybe at a school, a single school level, what, what have you stumbled upon or, or actively sought out in the way of uh, information around what works and what doesn't in a time when resources are getting scarcer? Well, I think that Paul mentioned, you you know, you talked about, trying to talk to you, um, how much more we know. It isn't rocket science anymore. I mean, back in the late 90s when we learned what it takes to read, for a child to really read and what matters most, was really the beginning of an onslaught of a lot of research and literature about basically outlining what we need to do in classrooms, schools, districts, etc. cetera. Um, but I want to go back to changing the subject a little. What you, we John responded about philanthropy, and I feel like we can look at it like there's a system and there's this amount of money, and this is what we have, so how do we make do? I mean, we if you were ever a classroom teacher, you go to yard sales. So we're used to making do. But when you have uh, philanthropists and local um, foundation saying we want to get together and do something that's deeper and broader and earlier, it allows you to be innovative. And I think that's what our current model doesn't promote is new ways of thinking of systems, which is why we have people who are replicating charter school models and starting their own charter schools is that the current system really doesn't work and there are great inequities in the system. Okay, well, let's talk about some. You, you mentioned charter schools as one of the ways that that gets done. Um, and some would say that charter schools have, in fact, liberated many dollars um, from where they formerly flowed. Uh, what do you see? As, are those experiments in charter schools in California in particular working? Are we learning something from those? I mean, uh, you could argue that in some ways those were spurred on by financial woes as well as bad performance uh, feedback from communities. Are, are we learning something from that experiment? I think it's important that we do. I mean, one of you know, we have a local charter school where you were principal when I first met Paul, Peabody Charter School, that has done a lot of great things. And I know in conversation with the principal who started that charter school, the question always was, we're doing these things and how come it's not being replicated? And, you know, one thing we took from Peabody is we run our own cafeteria. So everything is homemade and organic and it has a really important feature for schools um, and for the school itself and so that is the one thing I can point to that we replicated from a charter school but I don't think that replication maybe on a franchise level it's greater but why, from why do you think that is Sally I mean you you were a teacher at the school and a principal assistant principal as well you uh, were you were principal work there yeah so now you're principal at Harding and you're taking these ideas there is it just the people who are taking them other places why is there not a more systematic I think it's all effort? relationships I think it's, I mean, I think that's why we're a partnership school with you, mm -hmm. right? It's the relationship between the educators and the collaboration and ideas flow from people to people, not from uh, the abstract organization to organization. I also think the system that we have, Paul, I think pretty clearly identified as we began, is not very conducive to allowing for that kind of uh, innovation. I know mm -hmm. when, when Sally and the uh, Harding university school got started. We had to create language to allow people, <clears throat> certificated staff members there, who didn't want to be on that bandwagon, a way to move out. And we did that collaboratively. Um, that was a good starting point, and I think it really showed how the union wanted to tie into 
helping these kinds of initiatives move forward. Mm -hmm. We also worked with the university on a, a number of topics to try to make that happen. But I, I don't think there's anybody open with open arms out there waiting to uh, embrace those kinds of ideas. We're in a pretty staid profession. Uh, it doesn't change very easily. Um, there's not dollars out there to create that change. As an outsider, can I ask a question? This is a you observation can. that might get other people in trouble. I don't know, but my perception into at least the Santa Barbara School District and talking to principals and asking them, well, that sounds like a great idea. Do you tell that to other principals in the district? The answer has been no. It's like, that's weird. I mean, you know, if there's innovative ideas or things that you think work, why isn't it the culture or the system of like, of at least exchanging ideas, other principals can say that that's terrible, I don't want to do it. But to yeah. hear that, like you don't even share that. You don't even say this is what worked for me. I, f I f find that odd. Well, Lynn said it's a fairly, you, I think you used the word staid uh, profession. What, why is that or what is it about the, the, the teaching world that prevents that as John's asking? I, I think it's sort of, my impression, um, I got my education degree from the University of Utah and I had teachers there that had gotten educated 30 years prior to teaching me and essentially no change had occurred mm -hmm. in the instructional models. We were doing the same things, we were looking at the same uh, instructional models and we were asked to take that and go forth and continue to do what they would, had done. So we had a 90-year a, a window where nothing had essentially changed. This is not a high paying profession and it's hard to get the best and the brightest to buy into that. When you can go to work for Microsoft and make $200,000 a year or you can start as a teacher at $45,000 a year and as Sally said, spend another six to $8,000 of your own money providing for those basic classroom needs, it's really hard. I, I, as a father of five, I have a hard time telling my kids to go into the, the business that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a systematic failure when we can't recommend it to our own kids. I um, was just thinking here as, as you were all talking, I think one of, probably one of the reasons that the profession remains stayed is everybody who's doing it is so busy doing it, you don't have a lot of time to think about it. We actually have a system that um, is a disincentive for a lot of people to get good preparation to go into teaching. And until our teachers are well prepared in the profession of teaching, um, they're not going to be able to affect the kinds of changes that need to happen in schools. One of the things that educators never do, or at least have not done, and I heard Paul say it, and I know that these ladies are doing it with their programs, is take time to analyze what we've done. We've mm -hmm. finally come upon this like a great aha. Hey, we need to sit down and look at that. As Paul said, <laughs> timely testing. Mm -hmm. The state tests we get back come in August, September? August. And that's, you know, six months to a year after we've had those kids. It's not like you can go back and grab those kids and bring them back and say, oh wait, I didn't quite get done teaching you. I have a little more to give you. I've heard the comment about teaching being stayed. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it connotes to me a, a level of inertia and inaction and resignation and a uh, sense of distance between your efforts and what the outcomes are for kids. And I'm here to say that, you know, culture happens in any organization, notwithstanding a district. <laughs> and if you do nothing, culture happens. If you do something, culture happens. It, it's all on you to do it. Now, mm -hmm. when you get in that mode of, of professionalism, which really has the results as its centerpiece, uh, I don't think teaching is going to be stayed at all. I think it's going to be dynamic, and I think it's going to be inspired. We don't make money in education. We're, none of us are here to do it. None of us entered education to do it. We had a moment of inspiration working with young people. I think everyone here around this table can tell a story mm -hmm. of, of why they became a teacher, myself included. And, 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 and that little fire in us you know, does go out if we're in an organization you know, that, that doesn't uh, help us uh, understand that what we do really has a real outcome for kids, whether it's a third grade or, or twelfth grade. It's up to us to create the conditions for teaching to be dynamic and professional. Right. Now, a couple of you mentioned assessments, so let's let's jump in a little bit into the preparation of teachers and the actual assessment of how they're doing, because that's obviously a hot topic right now. It's in uh, any number of public forums have have addressed this. There's certainly films in the in the theaters right now addressing this. Um, 
let's talk first about the, the, the preparation piece of it. And actually, I, I want to go to you, Tina, to start with. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that there is a role in preparation when someone leaves the actual program for some sort of testing, assessment, numerical scoring um, to track a teacher's performance? Or is that something that, that doesn't work in a, in a classroom setting? We should be basing our teacher sort of evaluation effectiveness on how effective they are with children. How, how we define effectiveness is where we all are uh, having problems and disagreeing mm -hmm. because it can become very narrowly defined. Um, what a teacher does is far more than raise test scores in mathematics and English or reading. And um, this is why we need to have um, teachers who are prepared to do all sorts of things that may or may not get measured in the end, but we do need to be measuring these things, and these have to be the measures of effectiveness. And we should be tracking back to teacher preparation programs as well, because um, there are uh, very, very poor preparation programs out there in California alone. I think it's hard to measure, because I'll take, um, a if you have a school with a lot of needs, you have 95% of your kids are free and reduced lunch, most of them are English learners, you have, out of 500 kids, you have a third of the district's homeless population, let's just say, that mm -hmm. was my school last year. And you are a social worker, you're a psychologist, uh, you're mm -hmm. the health assistant, you're the disciplinarian. Oh, by the way, are you bilingual? And can you go to the, again, out on the weekend, pilfering for things you need for your classroom? And that is the life of a teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, what goes into making a classroom work at a school like ours, and then another school where 50% of the kids are already proficient or advanced, those are two totally different games. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a big fan of measurement. I'm not convinced that we have the sophistication in our thinking about how we would go about that in order to give teachers a fair shot. Because mm -hmm. the minute you do that, all my good teachers are gone. Because I will tell you, they, they know that X, Y, and Z school they're advanced coming in, they're advanced going out, you have a good or bad year. At my school, right? I would say if a teacher has a bad year, we know that's gonna be hard on the kids because their kids have so many needs. So my questions are around what kinds of measurements, what other measures beyond yeah. test scores, and how mm -hmm. do we account not just for the classroom, but the school system and what that looks like in terms of conditions and the district system. And until we can answer those questions, I would say we have no business measuring teacher effectiveness. Okay. Paul, you have something to say there? We have no business measuring teacher effectiveness. Until I have the answers okay. to those Let's two sure questions. I get back to your last point. <laughs> Don't leave out my first part. Look, I think that the dialogue has to start on, on how we can draw a line from what we do in the classroom to results for kids. I think a lot of the discussion has to do with how you control for variables that otherwise would be legitimately uh, put forward as it's, it's not because of the tests are low because of this or because of that we want to be able to see over time that teachers can affect growth with kids and I think that's that's been at the heart of what we've been hearing about but it's kind of been lost in the noise of the positioning that's been going on my fear about it is that we're, we're gonna go to our corners and fight when what we should be doing is saying look this gives us an opportunity to revisit evaluation of performance in a way that we can all consider fair and if there's a way to control for variables, given all the other things we're doing that we know works, then we should have that discussion and, and, and establish a trust level and try some things. Let's go there in just a minute. I want to ask, I think what I've heard you all say is that you would agree that uh, evaluation of teachers is, is a good thing with certain caveats, and that is that certain variables have to be controlled for as far as what community you're working in, what this, the students have coming in, um, that there has to be a broader discussion, teachers have to be brought along, and part of that discussion ultimately agreed to, here's the measures by which we should be be uh, assessed. Is, is that is that a generally agreed upon framework with the obvious caveat that a lot of those what's would be disagreeable at, at some point? I would, but i just yeah. add one more thing. I don't think we're just talking about um, an evaluation system that's fair to teachers. Assessments drive instruction, and so if our assessments are narrowly focused, that's going to drive the kind of instructions that or instruction that teachers are going to necessarily have to focus on if it means that that's one of the primary ways that they're going to be evaluated. Well, and that's a good point. Things. Assessment's in play right now, and it's being driven by the common core standards effort. That the, the teaching has, to the test. Well, phenomenon. yeah, I kind of take issue with that statement, but it's awfully familiar to people. But, mm -hmm. but you're right, okay, that the question is, well, what's a fair test? 
And a lot of that's driven by the financial reality of how you do it. Mm -hmm. we, we had an assessment system in California in the early 90s called the California Learning Assessment System mm -hmm. that was really performance-based and yeah. emphasizes higher level thinking and, and application and things that a lot of people would defend as educationally sound. Mm -hmm. But guess what? There's just no way the state could afford it. It was expensive. It was expensive. Yeah, it was, was labor-heavy. Right. And then, uh, and because of all that, it also involved a few things that under Governor Wilson's administration were decided were too invasive. I don't know if you remember any of that. Mm -hmm. And then they trashed it summarily, just went away. And the best of what we understood about it right. actually, unfortunately, went away with that. So now we went back to multiple choice, right? right? It's economical. <laughs> It's quick, it's Scantron, and I think that's unfortunately has, has uh, created us, uh, created a de degree of myopia about how we really assess student achievement. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem too. One interesting thing that springs up for me is that teacher preparation to date hasn't been quite as regulated, I think, as, as schools have, but it's becoming more so. And um, recently, I guess back in 1998, legislation was passed to have a teaching performance assessment required for all pre-service candidates to pass prior to licensure. Well, the most valuable thing about that work is teacher educators getting together every year, calibrating, looking at our candidates' work, and understanding what they're doing and how we improve upon our programs. It's been very difficult work. It's been extremely, um, a, a huge strain on our resources, and many of the larger institutions that, you know, prepare hundreds of teachers a year have said they, they can't do it and they throw their hands up, they can't do it. But if we don't do this, we are going to be faced with a multiple choice test of teaching practice or, you know, reductionist views and understandings of what teaching is. My question is if we know that writing promotes thinking and we know that even at the college level and city college level, writing is the thing that most needs to be remediated along with math and reading, okay, mm -hmm. all of it basically. <laughs> um, we cannot have kids being prepared in this way. But I think that's mm -hmm. the unintended consequence of, okay, we got to get our scores up. So I think it's, it's true for um, teachers as well when you say that. That's what it makes me think. Of. If you go to a multiple choice and we're not looking at teachers writing and thinking and how mm -hmm. they approach their work, we're right back where we are with the kids. But by virtue of doing that with the kids, aren't we creating a whole new <coughs> class of teachers who are going to then prepare kids in that same way? Right. So I think it has to be all the way from zero through college, the way we talk about assessment and learning, and we have a much more robust and sophisticated way of looking at it. That includes standardized assessments that we can all agree upon mm -hmm. and go, okay, that has, to be the, that has to be the base, but there has to be something more. Because if that's all we're shooting for, where are we going to be in 30 years? Are we going to say we have kids who can read and write? But do they really think? Can they change the world? Can they take your job? Can they take your job? No, mm -hmm. believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so know, let's let's play what if for a moment. Let, let's say that we get there, and, and in fact the, the resources are available to get back to some of the best things that had, had been at least experimented with, though they may have never quite gotten to the, the scale they needed to be. Um, let's say that in fact teachers have that conversation across the state, administrators uh, have that conversation, and we get to a, an agreement about this is assessment. Uh, one of the one of the, the narratives out in the public right now is that the fear is so then what can teachers be fired for not meeting those standards should they be fired for not meeting those standards on the flip side should they receive merit pay for exceeding those standards um, when we talk about reward and punishment of teachers in classrooms uh, the, the conversation often stops and I'd like to hear your your comment on uh, if we were to get a little further with agreeing on what that system is then what let me lead out on that one Please. um being an educator, representing educators, I think I can speak for our profession at least to the point of saying that no good union, no good educator wants an educator that's not productive and helping the profession. We realize that we're in a customer service industry. We realize that we have a product that's a real live thing that's going to either make our world a better place or not. And uh, we really have a vested interest in making sure that that those teachers that are out there are getting supported and it's no longer just the happy face evaluation uh, which really doesn't tell you anything. Um, you used to get the evaluation that was oh the parents love this teacher, oh gets along well with the kids, oh great bulletin boards, oh helps a lot along, around campus. Happy face. You didn't know what it meant. You didn't know how to improve your teaching. So how do you feel about merit pay? 
I'm opposed to merit pay simply based on the fact that we don't have an even product that everybody is uh, given to work with, and I think it's divisive, and I think it really works at counter purposes to where our mission is, and that's to move forward as a profession, uh, as administrators, as board members, as students, as parents, as principals. I feel uh, that I'm not ready to pass judgment on it, and, and I, I would like people to be open-minded about it, as, if nothing more, as a, a way, as a let's try it out. Uh, do I think that everybody's motivated by uh, uh, a bonus at the end of the line? Uh, not necessarily. Are, are there any number of issues that you could raise about its fairness and equity? Absolutely. But in absence of really trying it in a way that over multiple years we could look at it from the teacher's perspective and everybody else's, uh, I'm not sure I'm ready to make conclusions. Uh, let me ask you, if you just had to institute a merit pay system within your own school, is that something you could see your way to doing right now? You know, it's interesting because I was just reflecting, my dad started the very first merit pay program in New Hampshire as a, a school board negotiator. And as a teacher, you probably know I worked for Paul, I would be the first one to go bring it on. But I don't think I would do it at my school, and I think I have a totally kind of changed view on teacher development um, and careers and what it takes. I think I've learned more. I think looking at it from the university's point of view is that teachers are not made overnight. Mm -hmm. Elementary teachers teach math, science, social studies, PE, art, hopefully performing arts and music. We have all of those standards. There's no time in the day. They're social workers. You've heard me say all the other things that they do. And so to me, can you get a teacher right out of teacher prep ready to go? It's really a developmental process. Mm -hmm. So I have questions about how we help teachers develop and what that takes. And I think that adds another factor to what it looks like in terms of merit pay. So I am fundamentally not opposed to it personally. I just looking at my school, where we've been, the awesome teachers we have, seeing the work that they put in, looking at other schools and seeing results going, I'm not so sure, I don't know if we're there educationally to really know how to do that, but I'm not opposed to it. I just think that we tend to hover around an accountability conversation that keeps us trapped in our thinking, and I mm -hmm. think there's a lot of different ways to look at the problems of practice and the solutions of practice that um, we don't have time to look at, we're not partnered enough with people who are the, the ability to sit back and reflect because, you know, you spend a day at the school, we're running. We're running mm -hmm. and eating, not going to the restroom ever. This is the problem of elementary teachers. Right. And so I don't think it's a quick fix. Um, Tina, as someone who's, who's training teachers, do you see that, would you welcome a merit pay system or is that really missing the point of, of the the conversation and the bigger questions. That's so interesting you say that because I was going to say we really need to change this conversation, not this conversation we're having here, the conversation we're having in this country. We spend so much time talking about how do we fire bad teachers as if that's going to be the panacea for the problems that we have. We talk about, well, let's give them merit pay, let's do this, but we don't talk enough about what are the kinds of things we do to help them do their job better. What is the preparation that we give them prior to going into the classroom? High-performing countries like Finland spend many years uh, preparing their candidates to go into classrooms. They only take the top-level candidates into their programs, and then once they get there, they also provide them with lots of support over time. Our teachers spend a lot more instructional time than any of these um, high-performing countries do. They don't have time to think nor do they get the preparation that allows them to think about what their students are really understanding, learning, doing. There are no state uh, testing in Finland. The way that teachers and administrators know how students are doing are because the teachers themselves have nuanced understandings of how their children are doing. They research the effects that their practice is having on their kids, and they talk about it all the time. And they don't leave the profession after two years either. They stay in the profession, so there's some consistency and they can learn over time. I would ask you this, uh, are the people who are going into teaching more, uh, uh, you know, as a group, uh, showing greater academic preparation than the people going into teaching in the United States? And uh, are, are, are the folks who are going into teaching in Finland making a competitive wage that would keep them there 
for a long time compared to teachers here. And I think that's a fair question if you're going to keep going Finland on this here. Sure. Both wage and benefit. They both are competitive. I mean, and, but, you see, but you see, that's a fair question, though, because when we talk about merit pay, okay, there's an assumption there that there's a built-in assumption that what teachers are earning now is, is inadequate. Look, we have to have this conversation about merit pay. The, 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 the dialogue is all over the country now, and, and it isn't like we have a choice to say we just don't believe in it. We have to talk about it. Yeah, okay. but we have to talk about the larger pieces, too, that we never talk about. Well, and I'm not disagreeing with you there in the context of, of, of the larger context. But, and here's the larger context. It's a, is it a compensation issue? Is that what it is? It, you know, people, the last time I checked, a lot of college kids are, are looking in the uh, professions and careers that start with what they're going to make. Mm-hmm. Correct? And, and is, that, is that in their calculation in becoming a teacher? Sure. And, 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 and it is. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's have the dialogue about compensation. And, and, and let's understand, though, that, that, that you know, as, as an entity that's publicly funded with rising public awareness about the effectiveness of schools, that conversation has to include, well, if I'm paying you, what am I getting out of this? You know, what's going to happen with the kids in the system? We've got to remember, though, one of the chilling factors is that 50% of the teachers leave the profession in the first five years. So that speaks, I think, volumes to the fact that we, we, as you said, need to reorder our priorities. Does it mean paying people more? I, I believe it does. Is merit pay a part of the conversation? It, it possibly could be. I, I won't dismiss it out of hand, but I would certainly say that we have enough other issues that we need to address prior to this. We're a very quick fix society, and we want a quick fix. And everyone yeah. says, give somebody a chunk of dough, and you're going to get a quick fix. What you're going to get is... An inherent system of dishonesty, I think. You're going to find that somebody says, I need the money for an operation. I need the money to make a house payment. And I'm just going to do what I need to do to help my kids get up that little bit extra. I don't think that's really what we want to build into our system. This is all inside ball. I mean, you're not talking about stuff that the rest of us that live outside of the education world are going to get. I mean, I think a lot of the perception of teachers, hey, you guys get summers off. Right. Well, if I only work nine months a year, I'd be really great with that. And so I think a lot of the ideas coming just as an outside observer from the education system of what we need to do sound like I need more time to talk with my colleagues. You know, I need more money. I don't want to be held accountable. I mean, those three things, if you put those out to the public or these are our answers are not things that the rest of us are really going to get. So I, I, I do think there is. And, and so what do we do in the absence of being able to really understand what you guys are talking about, well, we go look for models where we think it's worked, right? Mm. Waiting for Superman. Oh, those models seem to work. Let's just do that more. I mean, it's not that we're dumb. It's just that you guys are talking a language and subtleties that the rest of us, like, you know, I want to know the kids are turning out well. I'm accountable in my job. You should be accountable in yours. We all understand merit pay in the private sector. Why can't you do that? So unless I think the education system... I think we all need to come to the table and you guys need to come up with answers that make sense to the rest of us and then we need to know what we need to do to support that. But I, I just think there, when I listen to it, there are two different conversations with, between people in the community that care about education that aren't educators and what educators talk about. It's just this fascinating disconnect. Well, I think so. everybody's gone to school. So everybody's their own expert, their kids go through school. Mm-hmm. Typically, people who are in positions of power and leadership have successful experiences in school and they have a successful children. So the quick drive-by conversations, which I am not a fan of, people walk away and go, oh, teachers have it easy. Oh, it's so easy. We have a lot of research. What it takes to apply the research for veteran teachers, new teachers, in a career trajectory, we're human beings, developing human beings who have to learn things, acquire new skills in systems that are antiquated, underfunded, conditions that aren't all there, is a conversation that everybody needs to understand and be part of. And I think that we do have an inside ball game, and the outside ball game is, does not understand what we're trying to do. And we are having two different conversations. It's how do you, I mean, it's what we're doing right now is having the conversation so that people understand the complexities. But 
you can't just say, okay, I'm going to evaluate a teacher unsatisfactory because that's the tool we have and they're going to improve. That's not going to improve teachers, mm -hmm. but we're going to put them in the peer assistant and review program after we've waited for them to fail, which is what we don't want to do with kids. We don't want to do that with teachers. Mm -hmm. Teachers need support. Teachers need tools. Teachers need resources. Teachers need conditions where they go, I have a copier. My school is painted. I live in Montecito and my school is as nice as my home. Why is my home like this and my school look like this? Why don't I have a clean room? Why don't we have the shrubs cut in the, we need to have conditions where teachers feel proud of their schools and we need to invest in the schools and we need to have a shared conversation between people who are in the game and you're pretty in the game. So, you know, you know a lot. So the merit pay idea is really the carrot version of this, but another another narrative out in the public right now is we should be firing more teachers. Um, we should have a, a quick, easy way. It shouldn't be a drawn out process. Uh, there's bad teachers throughout any system. What is your experience with this? Are, are there in fact that many bad teachers and should they be fired? So when I left waiting for Superman, I walked away with a lot of questions and one or missing pieces. And one is the only way a teacher becomes tenured in my school is me. A principal grants tenure. Lane cannot grant tenure. The university doesn't. A superintendent and principal, it's, it's really a management function. So I feel like if we don't want to have teachers who are not up for the changing, ever changing job of education, then we should not grant them tenure. And if we do make that mistake, we owe them the respect, due process, and fair approach to their evaluation because we're the ones who make that decision. So it's our bad. Has a teacher been fired at your school since you've been in your post as principal? Not at my current school. But I will say that I think I, and Lane, you can speak to this, I see more teachers making decisions about their own profession and whether or not they want to do the job they're being asked to do in the current conditions more than ever than when I was previously a principal. Is that accurate? I think that's accurate. As I said, 50% of the teachers leave in the first five years. All of those teachers don't leave just because they have a better job opportunity. Some of them are confronted with a very real fact that via the evaluation process, they have been told the very harsh truth that they're not ready for this profession and uh, sometimes they take the more humane route out and that's to say I'm going to tender my resignation. Um, I think when uh, a school decides that they uh, really want to follow process um, that it is possible to get rid of teachers that are not meeting the standards that the district has set. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say though if you ask me have teachers improved in their practice since I've been at this school, I would say absolutely and with the help of Lane. So we've worked together on different issues, how to help a teacher who's struggling in a particular area, and I think that's what you were alluding to, Tina, is changing the conversation. So if there are one, two, five percent of teachers who shouldn't be in the profession, it's management's job to do everything within the agreements with the collective um, bargaining units to uh, take the appropriate actions. But there's also a bunch of teachers who need to keep retooling and have the time. And I think that's the harder part of the work is how do you provide all the supports that teachers need so that they are improving along with the kids. Paul, you in, in your role, do you see that? Is that real? Is that a frustration that there are underperforming teachers or, or dare I say incompetent teachers that stay in the classroom year after year? And if so, why? Or if not, why are we hearing this as, as part of the narrative of what's wrong with the education at the moment? Uh, my feeling is, uh, it's incumbent upon the leadership in the district, the managers, the principals, the superintendent, to make sure that what they do in the world of evaluation is uh, evidence-based, it's fair, there's a line between the evidence and the performance in the classroom. Uh, if, if people have been uh, left who are not performing and still given satisfactory evaluations, it's the fault of the people who are doing them. And I happen to believe that uh, teachers need to show us something really quickly uh, that they have what it takes to be outstanding. Are they going to be outstanding instantly their first year? No. But I think we, we can discern that. And, and if it's not evident, we're not doing anybody a favor by granting permanency. We can find other people, really, who are more suited to do that job. That's pretty countercultural, though, because I I'm happy to non reelect and it has a negative impact on your school because you have a lot of turnover. Teachers start to worry like, 
Is anyone ever good enough? And what is this thing we're looking for? And then there's a real cost to turnover. And so I, I mean, we still have to back up to teacher preparation, recruitment, and hiring. Unfortunately, I don't think it takes many bad experiences with a less than competent teacher in your own life or your kid's life to really pull down your perception of the whole system. Right. I mean, if your kid has that second grade teacher that, you know, where they had a bad experience and you heard that the, someone went there before and two years before that was, a t that was a teacher that all the parents said, don't let your kid go to that class, that erodes trust between the, the tax paying and, and child giving community with the whole system. And it, it, it probably could be one or two teachers where that's what, that's a lot of the conversation. I'm not saying it's fair. I'm not saying it's just. I'm not saying it, it changes the conversation and we should support good teachers more. I'm not saying it denigrates process. I'm just saying from an outside perspective, it doesn't take much to, to really kind of tip that. I don't know, if, if you can't get that right, if you can't get that teacher that, you know, the last five generations of parents that have gone to your school say they don't want their kids to go to out of your school, I'm not sure here's, I trust here's, the rest of the Here's my answer to school. that as a leader of the system. And as much as we're talking about teachers and whether or not to uh, grant them permanency or tenure and the whole issue of firing teachers, uh, in my system, as the CEO of the system, my administrators, if they don't perform, are not going to be in my system, mm -hmm. okay? And that performance includes their ability to mm -hmm. to hold everybody accountable for high performance. The problem that you're alluding to is is the site administrator and other administrators who aren't doing their job, okay? So it isn't it isn't the teacher in the crosshair; it's the mm -hmm. whole system. Yep. And and we have bad principles, okay? We do, mm -hmm. and and they have to be removed, okay? We have to support them and their professional growth and all that. But bad bad principles. There's bad superintendents out there, definitely. And they need to be removed. You know, it's an up and down thing of, of reasonable opportunity to perform. And if you don't perform, really, then something has to be done about it because these are kids. But I would really agree with what John's saying. And that mm -hmm. is that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that customer service, I mean, for every bad teacher that's out there, it probably takes six or eight good teachers to override that for mm -hmm. you to say, I'm going to keep my kid at this school because I know the overall educational benefit of the school is going to be a very positive mm -hmm. one. Unions don't like that. I don't like that personally, and you know I think the best thing that we can do is work together to try to find that that common ground to mm -hmm. of, of of both support, uh, fair fair process, and as Paul said, you know the harsh reality of this may not be the job that you're cut out to do. I think I know what to look for in teaching. It's my mm -hmm. job to understand what to look for in teaching, but. Um, I think we live in a very small community that everybody knows everybody. And mm -hmm. once you get one rumor flowing, I think it has a tremendous effect on the way parents think about teachers in schools mm -hmm. as well. And a lot of, not a lot of times, but sometimes they're really based on very isolated incidents mm -hmm. with one child. And um, I don't think every teacher can be everything for every kid all the time. That's impossible. And I'm not saying that this is I'm not making excuses, but I am saying that parents need to be equipped with understanding what good teaching is, too. Well, and as principal, I'm often mediating the relationship between teachers and parents, and what's interesting to me is that um, you can have a high-performing teacher who has all of her kids proficient or advanced, but maybe that's not the teacher who has the best warm fuzzy for you as a that's parent or you are an, as a parent. <laughs> and then you can have a wonderful teacher who's so nice that the parents love that no matter what the performance is, that is the coveted teacher uh, for the mm -hmm. parents. And so I think one thing that it would be if we're thinking of solutions is that teachers really have to learn what it is to have. We say we want parents as partners, but we don't necessarily teach teachers how to do that. And I would really call out you know, the private sector to really help us with some of those because those are not skills that are, I'm not even sure that the university, as thorough as you are with your preparation, looks at that aspect of it. I mean, mm -hmm. I. I I learned it because I worked in the food and beverage industry. And I knew that if I had a customer leave upset that it was gonna take a monumental effort to bring back customers. But a lot of people don't come out of the university with that private industry sort of savvy. And as a result, you can get isolated. So I think we really can look at our corporate partners and say, you know, what is working for them? Because when you're upset and you go back to your car dealership, you don't want to hear, oh, I can't deal with you today. You want to hear, I'm going to get your car fixed. 
And we have those same kinds of, I think, things that we could draw on and use. So we're going to close, but I'm going to ask you each to answer this. If, if one thing, and you had a long list there, Sally, if one of those things, <laughs> you have to pick one, uh, could be different tomorrow when you walk back into the classroom or the office, you know, what do you think would be the, the, the best first step at this point, whether it's about the, this larger conversation with the general public or whether it's about some of the, the technicalities of the actual work? And, and Lane, I would like to start with you. One thing. I, I think it would be evaluating of the profession. By, by the general public. I think John hit it. You know, it, we, we, we do speak educationese. Uh, the medical profession speaks its own language. People don't question an open heart surgeon because they're just happy to have the surgery be successful. Uh, but everybody's taught their child how to write, read and everyone's taught their child how to ride a bike. Um, so everyone believes that they can, they can teach. And uh, as Sally, I think, very eloquently indicated, uh, there are skills there that, that escape many people. Certainly. You know, I think from a bargaining standpoint, if we really want to get a good contract, we, we, we probably bargain in September when people are ready to have their kids go back to school. And uh, I think that's the piece that I would like to see. Or how about you, Tina? Build on that insane understanding of what it takes to become a teacher and an investment in that. So at UC Santa Barbara, we have um, a full-time 13-month program that has our candidates in schools all day long and then at the university in the afternoon, evening. So they have 12-hour days just on the ground or in a classroom. And it's, so they, they can't work, they can't earn money aside from that. They learn to become much better teachers than somebody who's taking a few online courses, finding their own placements in a classroom, that sort of thing. But they're earning the same teaching credential. So um, I wish that we would um, pay our candidates to prepare to become a teacher, screen them before they come in, like they do in Finland and Singapore and all of these other countries. He, he said, whatever we want. We can <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not anti-Finland. In fact, tomorrow. No, no. Got Singapore in there. <laughs> all right, so, so Singapore. greater understanding of, of what it really takes to become a good teacher and, and, and an set up systems that actually support and, and invest in systems that actually do that. Okay, thank you. Paul? Uh, I'd like to see uh, everybody on the same page of, of, of what we're about and why. You know, if, 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 if uh, Mr. Clark over here, who I've worked with now multiple years, is still feeling like an outsider to this conversation, then, then, uh, then I want to look within and ask myself what more can I do to make these basic things clear to the public about what we're about and why and what works. And, and I think if we do that, uh, and, and maybe it's a filmmaking entity or some other entity that isn't out to tell a story, because even with Waiting for Superman, the folks that interacted will tell you that they were there to tell a story, so they wanted to create a narrative. Uh, did, it, did it open the dialogue? Sure. Is it completely uh, as it should be across the board? No. Okay, so, so we need to kind of clear out here and, and go to an entity that said, well, basically, what do we know that works in schools? And, and what I'd like to see is, is uh, for all the schools that are put out there on the failing list, you know, and we know this because those studies have been done and they've been funded by foundations. We know that there are schools that have high populations of low-income kids, minority kids, and English learners. They exist out there in wonderful little islands, and they are succeeding. And that's what we should be talking about. Okay. Thank you. Sally? Leadership. From who? Everybody. Who? We need teachers to be leaders. We need principals to be leaders. We need superintendents to be leaders. We need philanthropists to be leaders. We need the university to be leaders. And it's not administrators. I think there was a question about an administrator. I'm not an administrator, I'm a leader. And I think we need to have programs that are developing leaders for our schools and not administrators. So leadership across the board within education. Leadership standards were at the 90s. Leadership, this is our century and we still haven't gotten there. We didn't talk about principal preparation, but we sure know a lot about what it takes. But, you know, I worked with Ohio on their principal standards, and we added a standard on leading change. We are in an environment of ever-changing technology, economies, peoples, and we need people who know how to lead change, and they have the courage to stand up and do things differently. Thank you. And for John the Outsider. <laughs> Aww. Or so you've well, been deemed. Yeah, I know, but I was part of it was just playing that role. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I, I think there may be sometimes there are political moments where society comes around and swings around and looks to a particular issue and says, okay, we have to do better. And I think education has bubbled below the surface for a long time, but perhaps this is one of those times where it's popped up enough where 
there's enough people that are concerned enough to say, all right, we really do have to get on it this time. Um, and so I think that's a moment to use. I, I think I, I do think we need to come together as communities to talk about that. And I think whatever dissonance is within the system, if you guys agree on, upon a bunch of things, probably need to come together pretty quickly because I think what society right now is looking for answers and people mm -hmm. with them, and people that can lead them. So to the degree the education community said, you know, we really kind of know how to do this, let's put it on the table. And we need this, let's put it on the table. Because I think what I see, at least in our community, is enough people finally getting to the point of, you know what, we actually really aren't happy with how things are going. You know what, we really are failing too many kids, so let's see if we can make a difference. And I think you guys have the answers. We need to put them on the table and support them. Thank you. Sure. Thank you all for your time, your thoughts. Thank you. Certainly more to come, but uh, this is a good start, so thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.